right, so I'm going to do the quantum ball fluids again. Um, and uh, I'll repeat some of what I did last time. And then uh, we'll do the new stuff. Does anybody have a question? So basically, what we're talking about is a B field and a the electrons are confined to a plane in two dimensions, and you have a um, perpendicular magnetic field. Um, there's the Field says EY, you get a current JX, sigma XY, EY, and that's just because um, of the V. In other words, if you have the field in this direction, then um, you have, um, they'll be moving, the electrons will start to move in that direction, and then you'll have V. Uh, cross B will push them out, and so the, the electrons are actually be moving the other way, going in the Y direction. But of course, it's the minus. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, the by the current we mean the current, of course, is the way the electrons go if they were positive. So. Oh God. All right. It turns out that sigma X Y is effectively some limit nu e squared over 2 pi. And um, when you put in all that, you get e squared in e 2 pi over 2 pi e g a. And all together, it's e and e over g a. Anyway. It turns out that due to impurities, this thing actually has plateaus, but I'm not going to talk about that. So this is B, this is sigma. All right. Now, there's this fractional quantum model by which is that when nu is 1 over an odd integer, then, uh, then uh, it's also, in some sense, incompressible. Um, and we've got flux quanta, and the number of these is uh, EBA over 2 pi. Um, and um, the 
ratio of n phi to n e is then if you just divide one by the other, you find out that that's one over n. What we said last time. And again, it's special when that's an odd integer. And um, what seems to be happening is, is that you have an electron and then you have, um, say, an odd number of objects there, and you move this other electron around it like that, and you get a phase change, EPI pi plus IQ phi over 2, which is then minus 1 from EVI pi, EVI e, I've gone from Q to E. And um, if this is minus 1 EVI E over 2, 2n two plus 1, phi 0, then um, you can make this plus 1 if, um, if well, this <coughs> phi 0 is Is the fundamental unit here, which is 2 pi over e. And um, so the e's cancel, and this is all together. Minus e to the i, 2n plus 1 over 2 pi. And so you make that 1 here, 2n plus 1. Well, it's automatically 1, um, because that's bonus, I get Ah, the 2's cancel. Okay, so this way the electrons can condense. Now, this group KHZ um, wrote down an effective Lagrangian, which, um, in fact, I think would have been a simpler treatment than the one that I'm, uh, the one in the Z gives, which. I found rather uh, complicated. Well, it's, it's, let's put it this way, it's, it's very abstract. And anyway, if you, if you do this uh, approach, you, um, you, you wind up with, let me see where, where I've got that. then the, the quasi-particles turn out to be vortices with electrons whirling around them. And um, this clearly is the sort of Lagrangian you'd want for vortices. Um, the, uh, this is then a charge scalar field, and uh, you can have psi essentially with zero here, and if this V, for example, is uh, psi dagger psi minus, say, v squared squared times some coupling constant, well, minus because it's a Lagrangian, um, then uh, you have psi become v and you can have a vortex if, if going around here, psi is essentially v e to the i theta or e to the i n theta, and then it's a string n vortex. And if on the other hand, psi is b is minus i and theta, then it's an anti-vortex. Frankly, this, I think, would have been a much simpler treatment. But instead, um, uh, z chose to emphasize the churn simons approach. Um, the, the advantage of the churn simons approach, in fact, let me just, just, just say another reason why I think this might have been much simpler had we done it this way. Um, what do you have here? You've got 
this vortex is effectively a flux tube. So you've got a magnetic field coming through here, you've got the electrons going around, and that's exactly the anion picture that Wilczek was talking about in uh, his article. So I think it would have been far clearer to do that approach. Instead, what Z did was to say, well, let's say that the Lagrange density is some Lagrange density, and to which we add a churn Simon term, which um, we can think of as epsilon ijk, ai dj ak, and then we also have some current coupled to this churn Simon gauge field. So this gauge field isn't um, the electromagnetic gauge field, this is a churn Simon gauge field. Um, and the idea of the churn Simons uh, is that, well, first of all, churn Simons works in two, two, two plus one dimensions, and we've essentially got a two plus one dimension system. Secondly, we saw that the churn Simons theory was a metric free theory, and so it really reacts to the topology rather than to the details of short distance physics. Moreover, there's, there's something more that I'll go into in a minute having to do with uh, the renormalization group in dense matter physics that uh, I, I went through in class, but I, I think I'm going to go in there. Oh, I didn't bring my notes. Anyway, I'll, I'll wing it. Um, so, uh, Z mentions that there are five aspects of this. The first is that it's a 2 plus 1 D system. Secondly, uh, this current JU is conserved. Three, we want to use a local action, and so we introduce gauge fields to make the thing local. Four, we're interested in big distances and uh, small k and omega, and uh, that's where the renormalization group will come in. And finally, five, uh, B, uh, the external B breaks P and T, um, in the sense that if you were simply living in the plane and just experiencing the external magnetic field, you'd say, well, we've, we, we don't have any parity in variance here, or time and motion. Okay, so now let me get to um, the uh, the uh, the the churn side, not the churn signs, the renormalization group in uh, condensed matter, or indeed in any theory, uh, in D dimensions, and I'm sorry that this is D and D, but capital D suggests path integration, so probably. Yeah. I, I want to think about the following thing schematically. So we've got a term in the action that has n powers of the field, but we have p derivatives. What I did in class was the case where p was zero. And in fact, the way, we, the way the whole thing started was we wanted the action to remain invariant when we scale space by L. And um, when we scaled space by L, we wanted the term where p was 2 and n was 2, because that's the free action for main invariant. And that told us how phi has to transform. And um, in fact, 
what we see here then is the GNP of L goes as L to the D minus N D minus 2 over 2 minus T. It's a short, it's just hopeless. GNP. It's a bit of a pun there. It, it was a pun, but they switched from gross national product to gross domestic product. Okay. Now, do you want me to um, derive this? Do you guys have a pizza one? What's that? Oh, the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> pizza. I, I was like, uh, yeah. I didn't know what you were. All right, here, let me. Oh, I just saw it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that was really cool. This isn't dimensional regularization, right? D is D is fixed. Thank you much. You look pretty nice. Yeah, you should. Copy that. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so you um, you were saying this isn't the dimensional regularization approach, right? D is D is fixed. I mean, the the, the having the D in the that's right. No, no, no. Yeah, dimensional yeah. regularization. Is something that's right. All right, um, we might as well. I hope this is. So that's not it's 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 yeah it's. <laughs> well, why don't you have some pizza? It's vegetarian. Because I thought there might be a vegetarian person here. Um, um, this is meant for you guys to fill these out with so yeah. generosity. Yeah. Surprise. Okay, Alright, let me go on a little more with Do you want me to derive this thing since Oh, you came at yeah. just the right time. You came at just the right time. Oh, you have a good nose. No, I totally did forget. I'm glad to get it right now. Here, no, here, here, this. We're going to run out of plates on this thing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, do you want me to try to drive this? In fact, what I can do is while you guys are lunching the pizza, I can print out the part. All right? That sounds good. We can write what? That. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of scale the length. If you want the, an interaction of that form to remain invariant in your scale change.
just wait till Chris gets back in. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is we have an action DGX. There's a, a kinetic term. Some GN phi to the N, and we might as well, since we're doing this new way, sum over NP GNP dp phi n. Okay. All right, now, what do we want to do? We're going to be talking about z of lambda, which is an integral e to the minus s d phi, path integral, lambda. And by lambda, we mean that we have our fields, phi of x, our integral lambda, e to the i kx, phi of k, d dk over 2 pi to the d. And uh, this has k less than lambda, or Euclidean space, let's say. And, um, Okay, so corresponding to each such field, we can define a stretched field, phi sub L, some A of L, phi of X over L, L greater or equal to 1. So this is the stretched field. Okay. Phi of L, for example, is A of L. Well, I just said it was that. So it's A of L integral e to the i k x over L phi of k d t k two pi to the d. So what we've got here is effectively uh, you can think of it as stretched in x or lower values of the moment of the wave number. And um, so this z of lambda over L is then um, an integral lambda over L e to the minus s d c. And we can think of this also as an integral lambda e to the minus s d c sub L where L are these stretched fields. Okay. Now, the kinetic action of this field is integral d to the d, dx to the d, a squared of L over 2, d phi of x over L, dx squared, and I'm going to rewrite this as integral dd x over L, L to the d. So I'm pulling in a, out an L to the d there. A squared of L over 2. And I'm going to rewrite this as partial d x over L, partial x over L, L squared. And so if we let x prime equal x over L, this is an integral d d x prime L to the d minus 2, d here minus 2 there, a squared of L over 2, d prime phi of x prime squared. Okay? All right. So that means that if we choose this to be independent of L, that is to say A of L equal to L to the minus D minus 2 over 2, 
then uh, S sub k uh, is invariant. In other words, S sub k, uh, we can call this maybe S sub kl equals S sub k. Okay. And so now when you have this other kind of interaction with these derivatives, you just pick up this extra p, I guess. All right. So, this term, so for the GMs, we have, we'll have GM of L will be an L to the D from this term, an AM of L, GM, and this is then L to the D minus n t minus 2 over 2 t sub n but g n p of l will be uh, l to the d a n of l l to the minus p g n p which is l to the d <coughs> minus n d minus 2 over 2 minus p, gnp. Okay, so that's, that's, these are actually rather important relations. That's one reason why I wanted to do these over again. There's one big piece left, so some, some hungry graduate students should grab it. So, um, what kind of terms can we use then to create an effective field theory for a whole fluid, a fractional quantum whole fluid? Um, and are, in, if we're interested mainly in long distance effects rather than short distance effects. Well, we want one such that GNP grows with L. Well, one term that would grow with L would be this, because it would go as, it would be a G2, and a G2 goes L to the 3 minus 2 over 2 times D minus 2, which is to say L to the, that's 1, that's 1, L squared G2. The trouble is, this destroys gauge invariance. So we can't have that. Yeah. Was there a question? Um, well, I guess now there is. Um, <laughs> uh, so why does that? Uh, I mean, that's a Lorentz scalar, right? The NU. It's a scalar, yeah. It's so a light transformation, not gauge transformation. All right, but I mean, can we? I mean, doesn't it go away under, you know, maybe derivatives or derivatives or? Like that. I mean, well, I, I guess my. Right, I want to know it's invariant under Lorentz transformations, right? Right, but it's just. This says nothing about the gauge transformation. Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess the thing is that these uh, the the amines are uh, sorry the amines are functions of space time. Mm -hmm. So turn the sign and gauge field. One or, two, one or two lectures ago, we did the Chern-Simons theory, and I'll write it down in a moment. Um, the Chern-Simons theory is this, it's a G21, epsilon mu nu lambda, b mu d nu a lambda. So one derivative, two gauge fields, how does it go? G21 of L, is L to the D is 3 minus N is 2 
d minus 2 is 1, we divide by 2, and then we have p minus 1. So this goes as L G21. So the Chern-Simons term becomes more significant at larger distances, which is what we want. It's also gauge invariant. We showed that um, a couple of, uh, in the previous lecture, it might have been the last lecture or the one before, the gauge transformation here is A mu prime is A mu minus G mu and some lambda, not that lambda, some other lambda. And uh, of course, also not this lambda, with too many lambdas. In any event, you can uh, see that that's uh, gauge invariant. It, when you do make the gauge transformation, you get four terms, and uh, two of them vanish by symmetry, anti-symmetry, because this is anti-symmetric. And then uh, the, the one remaining uh, fly in the ointment is a total derivative. And uh, as usual, we integrate that out to a surface term, and then we ignore it for the time being. But I'll take up the surface term at the very end, because it turns out, as you might expect, when you do a tabletop experiment uh, with the magnetic field and the electrons you know, on the surface, um, the surface has an edge, so something's going on. All right, so let's look at uh, the Maxwell term. The Maxwell term is, of course, a G22. Well, G22 of L, well, you can see, it's just going to be, instead of L, it's going to be L to the zero. So the Maxwell term doesn't get better, doesn't get stronger at larger distances, whereas the churn Simons one does. So what we're going to do is we're going to ignore the Maxwell term. And we're going to effectively describe the theory in terms of a churn Simons gauge theory. Um, Um, so what we're going to say then is that L is uh, K over 4 pi epsilon mu nu lambda A mu D nu A lambda and then we're going to put in an electromagnetic field and this Electromagnetic field is not the one that generates the B field. The B field is already included in the constant K. Um, <clears throat> um, so this is a coupling of the the electromagnetic this, um, this other electromagnetic field to the Chern Simons field. That's right. Okay. And um, you can see by this, it has the same structure as this. So under under a gauge transformation, it will also be invariant up to a surface term. Certainly, if you use the same gauge transformation on both gauge fields, that will be true. Mm -hmm. If you use different gauge transformation functions on the two different gauge fields, I don't know. I haven't checked that. It turns out that you can um, do an integration by parts and Again, dropping the surface term, you can write this as mu nu lambda a mu d nu a lambda minus 1 over 2 pi uh, epsilon mu nu lambda a mu d nu a lambda. Do you want me to go through this or should we skip that? It's, it's, uh, I mean, I don't see it's an integration by parts in the surface. I don't see immediately how it works. But I'll take your word for it. All right, you want me to do it? I'll do it. Yeah, do it. OK. Um, if we integrate by parts, then epsilon, and drop the surface term, then epsilon mu nu lambda, a mu d nu a lambda goes to minus epsilon mu nu lambda a lambda d nu a mu. 
So we're there apart from a sign. Yes, you're entitled. I need dessert. Um, and now, what do you uh, do? That's that one. You can rewrite this as minus epsilon lambda mu nu a lambda d nu a nu. And then this is minus epsilon mu lambda nu a mu d nu a lambda. Here we're interchanging lambda and mu. The, the indices, but the dummy indices, so there's no problem. And then finally, um, so, well, sorry, Kevin. Um, yeah. I'm kind of lost. We're doing this to calculate the action for this theory, right or no? Uh, here, let me just finish this. We do, uh, we're, we're guessing at what the action might be for this theory. But if we have Lagrangian, how come we have to guess at the action? We're guessing that this is the right. Oh, let me <coughs> let me get you a chalk up down. Because I'm hoping that you'll be asking questions in order to find an answer rather than just pieces of chocolate. Mm. No, close. no, I really, I, I really do want to know what's going on. All right, on. good. I'm a little confused about where the integration's going on. Usually when you integrate by parts, there's an integral before. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, S is... So you're talking about the action. Integral d cubed x. So the integral is over all space-time. Well, and then, over... And that's, and that's what we're assuming. Okay. Well, it's over whatever the this, whatever this, this space-time is, and we're ignoring the surface term for the moment. Sure. We'll get to that later. So, I'm, I'm confused as to why we're guessing that this is the Lagrangian for the theory. So why, why don't we know the Lagrangian You're exactly? always doing that. Always in physics, yeah. you say, gee, could we describe physics by this action? And uh, it's either right or wrong. Actually, it's always wrong. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's either so less more wrong yeah. or more wrong. All right. Okay, so this is our action, but um, we're going to add in something and save time and space. What is the time? To t time and space, I'm going to add in a mu j mu. This j mu is the quasi particle current, which we're going to assume is conserved. And in fact, this Lagrangian, I think, tells us that J mu is conserved. Certainly without this piece, it tells you that J mu is conserved, because we showed that last time. All right. The next thing is we're going to uh, define another current, J mu tilde, as J mu minus 1 over 2 pi epsilon mu nu lambda d nu a lambda. So this is a current that's a quasi-particle current together with an, ele with a with an electromagnetic field current. And in those terms, in, this, in terms of this, our Lagrangian now is a chern simons term plus a chern simon gauge field coupled to this new current that we've defined, which is the quasi-particle current plus this term. And the quasi-particle current is coupled in the original theory just to the chern simons gauge field. OK. Why stop there and not add the other chern simons field into this current as well? Because it's the same form, right? I'm sorry. What, what was that again? I mean, I could, I could also include d nu lowercase a lambda, right? D nu. With like a factor of k or something. 
So then it's just a current coupled to a gauge field. But the current it, like includes a gauge mm -hmm. current. Tell me what to write down. I'm talking about this, right? This on the other board. Or that. Right there. This? Yeah, so I could add another term that's minus k over 2 pi epsilon mu nu lambda d nu a lowercase a lambda, right? Oh, <laughs> then my Lagrangian's, in other words, grab this thing. Yeah, exactly. And then my Lagrangian is really simple. Duh, yeah, maybe that's too simple. You want, uh, we want to keep the churn on this. All right. So let me just put this over there. Okay, so what happens now? Well, you remember we sometimes integrate out fields, and we, in order to do that, we use a particular identity, which we covered and derived carefully in the when we talked about path integrals earlier in the year. If we now in, take this Lagrangian and integrate out the churn simons gauge field, then we get the following Lagrangian. And you'll ask, am I really comfortable with this? No, I'm not really comfortable with this because of because of all the derivatives. Um, remember, we had... So that was what we did last time, right? That's the thing we did last time, and um, uh, there were certain terms that we had to wave away. Uh, the identity that we're using is the path integral identity, which is fine, e to the minus a half phi, in fact, if I write it in matrix notation, phi i, or with indices, I should say, kij <coughs> pj plus ji pi, and this is e to the one half ji k inverse ij jj. Okay, so that's that's. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But where our use of it here is a little bit slick. Okay, um, so this is what we've got after we integrate using this identity. We get effectively something like this. And writing it out using expanding J tilde in terms of J and the electromagnetic field, we get pi over K and it's a, a J mu minus 1 over 2 pi epsilon mu nu lambda D nu a lambda epsilon mu nu lambda d nu over d squared. By the way, it's not the one over d squared that bothers me. It's it's those the two delta delta the delta delta that we drop. <coughs> J lambda minus one over two pi epsilon lambda rho sigma d rho. Okay, so this is what we've got now. And so we've got a theory then that has JJ terms, JA terms, and AA terms. And now what's the uh, LAA? Well, LAA is this, that, that. And you've got a lot of epsilons, you've got one over the del squared and so forth. Effectively, you can argue that this is 1 over 4 pi k a mu epsilon mu nu lambda d nu a lambda. So that, that's effectively a churn simons term in the electromagnetic <coughs> field. Um, moreover, when we have a Lagrangian, and with an electromagnetic field, the thing that multiplies it, we can think of plausibly at least as a current. So we can say there's an electromagnetic current. And what is it? Well, it's this funny thing, 1 over 4 pi k, epsilon mu nu lambda d nu a lambda. So that's, that's what we do at this point. And now we can Fortunately, we're only in 
three dimensions, so this thing is a little bit simpler than it could than it would be before. And we can say J0, well that J0 EM, this is 1 over 4 pi k, epsilon 0 nu lambda, d nu a lambda, this is 1 over 4 pi k, d1 a2 minus d2 a1, and this is just bz over 4 pi k. So that tells us that this, this funny electromagnetic current that we introduced is in fact dz over 4 pi k. Well, that's not surprising because we defined it in terms of a, effectively a curl of A. Um, Z interprets this as saying that if we have a fluctuation delta B, then delta B divided by 2 pi k induces a change in the number of electrons. Why? Because this is the zero component of the, ele of the electromagnetic charge, so defined. In any event, it's, it's a change in the, char in the charge density of this <coughs> abstract current. Of Wait, what's, that amount. what's N? Number of, um, number of charges of, uh, of this JMU EM. J0 EM is BZ over 4 pi k. And so Z concludes then that the filling factor <coughs> is 1 over k. It's not obvious to me that that's so, but apparently, apparently that works. Anyway, G. The ith component of this electromagnetic current is, is 1 over 4 pi k, epsilon i nu lambda d, uh, d nu a lambda, and in particular j1, say, em, is uh, 1 over 4 pi k, epsilon 1 nu lambda d nu a lambda, which is 1 over 4 pi k, D2 A0 minus D0 A2, and that's what we call E2 over 4 pi k. And so sigma 1, 2 is 1 over k, which is nu. Then we use the AJ term. The AJ term, now if you think this is slick, I agree, it's very slick. You mean all these identifications? Yeah, all the identifications, um, and then the thing that I'm about to do. <laughs> this AJ term is A, an epsilon, a derivative, an epsilon, a derivative divided by a derivative squared next to a J. Well, we say this boils down to 1 over K, AJ, no, A mu, J mu. So this says then that the quasi-particle J mu has charge. So the, the quasi-particle of J mu has charge Q equal to 1 over K, which is nu. All right, well, that's sort of plausible. Um, finally, there's the JJ part. And the so we have some units of the electric charge or something? It's like E over K? Well, one of the problems here is that in this chapter, um, Z has sometimes absorbed E into A and sometimes not. And so um, ah, you may be right. So then in which case the charge would be 1. And that would be yeah, you, so, right. so you may be right that it's in. I mean, the point is it's a fractional charge, right? Yeah, all right. There you are. Uh, let's look at, um, finally, at LJJ. LJJ 
is then pi over k, it turns out, j mu epsilon mu nu lambda d nu j lambda all the del squared. And so the conclusion that is drawn at this point is that the quasi particles have fractional statistics theta over pi, 1 over k is nu. Frankly, I. So, um, I, where does that come from? I, I don't know. <laughs> This, this is not, I don't think, the best chapter in Z's book, but you guys wanted to see it, so I'm doing it. Um, I would have skipped it. Okay, so why should 1 over nu be an odd integer or, 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 or whatever? Well, let's look at LAJ. This is 1 over K, A mu, J mu. And that suggests that K quasi-particles have charge one, have unit charge. And I think your point's well taken. It's what we really mean is, in, is, is really in E here. Um, is this the whole? Yeah, let me call you back in unless it's an emergency. Hello? Bob. Um, all right. So if K, if K quasi particles um, have unit charge, and if these K quasi particles form a whole, then K has to be an integer because you want, want an integer number of these quasi particles. So there's, there's some hand waving going on here. Okay, if you have one quasi particle going around another, you get theta over pi equals one over k. That's what we had here. But if if this whole if this composite whole has k quasi particles in it, then when you take one of these guys and move it around another, you get a phase change because you've got k of these guys, but they're acting on k of these guys. And so altogether, you've got theta over pi is 1 over k times k squared, which is k. And so that says that um, the quasi-particles um, have a phase now that's actually k, and then if we want these, this, this composite of quasi-particles to be a fermion, then we want this to be 2n plus 1. And that's, of course, 1 over nu. So we've got this 1 over nu equals an odd integer, or nu equals 1 third, 1 fifth. OK, so but this has been, as, you know, as I've said, an overly slick treatment. Um, the picture here is that somehow an electron here, if nu is a third, the electron behaves as three pieces of charge one third with fractional statistics one third, which is pretty puzzling. All right. Moreover, this is described by a Chern Simons theory that's an intrinsically topological field theory, and so. People are, people say this is then topological order. Whatever order we're seeing here in this fractional quantum model, like this topological order. Of course, if we looked at short distance properties, then those would depend upon the impurities, and then we'd also have to bring in the uh, Maxwell term, which is more appropriate for short distance because it doesn't change in scale with distance. Now remember, we. Wait, what, what doesn't change in scale? The, 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 the effective strength of the, of the coupling constant that multiplies the Maxwell term, because it's a G22. Yeah, that one's constant, I think. Doesn't change when you stretch yeah. or shrink. But the, uh, the other one, the dynamics of the, well, not the dynamics, but that uh, the turn Simon's term is the term overwhelmed grows, by large scale stuff. It'll become more important. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, now, this effective field theory, as I said to you before, this one, I think this might have been a much simpler way of doing it. But this would have been, we would have simply interpreted things in terms of vortices. And then we would have said, well, you've got these vortices, you've got the electrons going around, and then you've got the will check any on effect, which is so nicely described by those two papers by will check, which I put on the web page. And I went through one of them in class in some detail. Like I even had my notes on on the web page. All right, let me try to finish this. Um, oh, okay. Remember, we dropped the service term, but a real experiment would have edges. <laughs> and although we can say grandly that we dropped the service terms in infinity because of a lack of funding. Um, <laughs> Uh, we can hardly use that excuse if this thing is, you know, the size of a pizza box. All right. Isn't that extraordinarily huge compared to the size of the electron? Well, no, no, the, 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 this plane is the plane in which the electrons are moving. Plane of area A. Okay, it turns out that um, there are physical degrees of freedom on the edges, and under a gauge transformation, these physical degrees of freedom change in a way that exactly cancels the surface, the surface term generated by the gauge transformation in here. Um, uh, another way of saying it, more physically in fact, is that an incompressible fluid like this has edge excitations. Are they chosen that way, or is that a consequence of something some physical thing. Well, it is interrupted by a sentence in the middle. An incompressible fluid like this has edge excitations mm -hmm. that act like waves on its boundary. And those are the things which under gauge transformation uh, change in a way that exact change that contributes to the action of change exactly cancels the surface. Okay. I don't know why. I think we're, all right, there's one more, I'm gonna, well, we, 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 when we integrated this thing out and got this funny business here, here we've got a non-local theory. If you bring back, and that's because we integrated out the Chern-Simons gauge field. If we bring it back in, we get a local theory. And in general, in physics, I guess one can say that gauge fields allow are a way of making local local field theories in, in some sense. Uh, one last topic: there are double-edged systems <coughs> like that, and you can have tunneling between them. I think that's all I'm going to say about that. And for well, one more thing: now, this this is just really stretching the theory. I think. Absurd limit. But the tunneling between the two layers, which has actually been seen experimentally, some people describe it in terms of a gas, get this, a monopole, anti monopole, but they're not ordinary monopoles, they're churn Simon's monopole. That's not as crazy as it sounds because, in fact, these instantons you can think of as tunneling between. Different theta vectors. So, all right. Okay. Well, here's these goddamn forms that you're um, supposed to fill out. I will disappear now. I hope you had enough blood sugar to. Yeah. And help yourselves to a candy if you fill these things out. <laughs> go ahead. Pick out a candy. I'll go get you some pencils. How many pencils do we need? Any one? Uh, three.
do.